Sticks, stones, and words can break bones, but following procedure can never indict me. Here's some super claims. We've got a special story today for all of you C and D class heroes out there. The men and women who handle 70% of crimes, you fine folks handling evacuations, and particularly those among you in the search and rescue division. It's not uncommon to feel unappreciated on the lower end. Budget cuts aren't uncommon in the world of D-Class. Hours are long, and for many, the path upward is locked behind the quality of your abilities. Some are born with super strength, speed, and durability, but more are born with slightly tougher skin, or an extra eye that can see infrared, such as the plight of one Fred Cumling, current alias Glass Lightning. The year is 2006. The nation is getting back on its feet, and Fred has one final trial before he can be accepted into the society of superpowered individuals. See, Fred is a relatively rare case in terms of superpowers. He had a partial muscle mutation in his legs. Powerful muscles throughout clearly enhance well beyond normal human capabilities, but his ligaments and bones are quite normal. To put it simply, his body can't keep up with his legs. Typically, applicants with a condition of this nature would be declined out of hand, more for their own safety than any discriminatory practice. Fred, however, has shown some promise with controlling his abilities, able to maintain an average running speed of 16 miles per hour for absurdly long times. Of course, he could push into the 30s, but he reported micro factors past that point. It's common practice to give applicants a trial assignment alongside veterans. Typically, these are low-risk situations, crimes expected to be handled by even the greenest of heroes, or are simulated crimes if it's a slow day. Unfortunately for Fred, his tests correlate with a major battle between S-class beings. The S, of course, stands for Super. The villain at the center of this situation was one Cleus Jai, a villain of Iris descent. Skilled with magic and a recognized threat, he was in a climactic battle after a string of crimes and assaults with the hero the SSPI hand-picked for the battle, Sahu Sekhim, the infamous soul manipulator from Egypt. I have been informed that, when discussing heroes of this nature, modern insurance has an important disclaimer to mention. We do not believe in, nor acknowledge the existence of magic, souls, gods, or other mythical beings, nor do we acknowledge any of the aforementioned mythical powers or beings as reasonable causes for claims. Modern insurance does acknowledge illusions and magic-like abilities, but will not accept the classification of any damage as magic or god-related. Anyway, the battle. The plan was to evacuate the city of Ogden, Utah for a major battle between the two S-class beings, accepting that the city would likely be lost in return for the capture of Class Dry. However, estimates for the danger zones were inaccurate, and citizens who had evacuated were still in danger zones. Thus was Fred's trial chosen, assisting with one of three evacuation teams in the wake of an S-class conflict. Fred Crumling was scheduled to be picked up in an SSPI-approved transport at 8 a.m. on a midsummer day but accounts from the driver and other members of his search and rescue team placed his pickup around 8.20 due to a misunderstanding on Fred's part. To his credit, an unmarked and slightly weathered white van would likely not scream official. To put it mildly, C-Class is not known for its top-of-the-line equipment. After an explanation that yes, Fred Crumbling was working for the SSPI, and yes, this white unmarked van was an official SSPI vehicle, and no, he was not lying. The driver of this van, Carl, convinced Fred to get in and begin his career. Alongside Fred were two experienced heroes, Eagle and Broken Watch. Upon meeting them, Fred claimed that the first thing he realized was that he should have spent more time on his outfit. Described as a tracksuit and sleep mask with the eyes cut out, Fred's suit was actually above the norm for new hires at the C rank. The second was that introducing himself with his actual name was likely a faux pas. His co-workers, like Fred, had abilities that were rated roughly at C rank due to their limited usefulness. Eagle, as his name would suggest, has the power to fly. Unfortunately, his hollow bones and overall ultra light weight hinder any attempts to engage in combat, making him a better scout for other heroes. Broken Watch is able to stop time. Interesting on his face, but he claims to be unable to affect anything aside from himself on stop time, and it only lasts as long as he can hold his breath. Truthfully, with some practice and creativity, he could be drastically higher ranked than he is. 
but Broken Watch seems content to remain at a lower ranking. After introductions were made, the 40 minute commute was summarized by all present as awkward. A not uncommon situation for new hires and lower ranked heroes due to the SSPI insisting that C and D ranked heroes follow protocol to the letter. Failing to do so results both in stiff penalties from the SSPI and harsher than normal prosecution for legal fees. In light of this, Morden Insurance has a few conversation starters that are both safe and fun. Next time you're in a situation like this, try talking about the mission you're about to undertake. Ask questions about the details, the context, and even the ethics of it. You may think this kind of conversation would only last a few minutes, but many heroes report that their drives end within mere minutes of bringing up the topic. Another fun starter is to ask everyone about their first mission. More often than not, it will get people feeling nostalgic and wistful. Try it sometime! Morning Insurance is not responsible for any conversations that take an unpleasant turn nor breaches of SSPI confidentiality requirements. At the evacuation site, Fred calmly described the city in chaos. Terrain that had once been soft and rolling hills and mountain trails had become jagged crags. The former outskirts and suburbs of Ogden had become death traps, littered with houses and cars teetering over tears in the earth created by the ongoing conflict. Fred, Broken Watch, and Eagle reported that they went to work immediately. Carl stated that they, quote, stood about gobsmacked for at least three or four minutes for finally getting to the frickin' job. Not that I blame him. Wild situation. Eagle took to the skies, scouting out the two mile area their group was assigned to for trapped and confused citizens. Broken Watch and Fred would escort civilians to a nearby safety zone. Fred carrying wounded and young citizens while Broken Watch assisted with dodging and anticipating incoming projectiles while relaying messages from Eagle. This trio of heroes proved remarkably efficient, especially given their relatively low ranks. With their synergy and unexpected meshing of powers, they outperformed multiple B-ranked rescue teams. In total, they are able to rescue 32 civilians over 90 minutes, practically unheard of for C-class rescue operations. Mind you, this process had not been a silent one. Frightened cries and pain screams, the explosions and fighting of Sahu and Cleus were ongoing, and it wasn't uncommon for projectiles to come soaring out of the city while many miles away. Fred had taken occasional breaks while waiting for Eagle or Broken Watch's reports to watch this battle from a central location. To his surprise, a particularly bright object crashed right next to him. A woman in robes lay in a crater next to Fred, a fact which Fred took several moments to identify. The heroes listening always identify projectiles before reacting. Usually it's just debris, but sometimes it's a co-worker, and every second counts. He didn't know who this woman was, but he swore she would have looked like a stereotypical Egyptian if they'd worn heavy armor and tactical boots. To Fred's credit, once he recognized that she was a human, he instinctively picked her up and began to escort her to the safety zone. Always lift with your legs, especially when they're super strong. Fred ran for a few minutes with this unconscious woman before the villain caught up with him. Wearing his signature tuxedo and top hat, Claire's Drag was known for his eccentric fashion style and insistence on formal appearances while working. His clothing tattered and burned, he was described by others at the scene as combat weary and quite unaccommodating of surprises. Fred later reported he looked like a kid's party magician after a particularly bad house. Fred had gotten himself in the middle of a battle that was far, far outside of the scope of his work. He, after realizing who he was probably dealing with, adjusted his course away from the evacuation zone and began running downtown. I'd like to point out that this reaction, despite technically being an SSPI infraction and a potential fight from us at Morton, was a wise choice that you should think about pursuing if you find yourself in a situation like this. By turning and running into town, he was avoiding further civilian threats at his own peril. Fred claimed that, in his terror, he began hallucinating instructions. Things like, move left, and jump right now, were whispered to him, and he found himself narrowly dodging all of Cleus's attacks. As we would later learn, Broken Watch had been stopping time and conveying these instructions as he ran, accurately predicting the attacks of the magician. Eagle had also offered his assistance, though his aid was within SSPI protocol. Upon witnessing Fred's mad dash, he first reported the situation to Carl, ensured a rescue team would take over their area, and flew to assist his teammates. Fred, with Broken Watch's instructions, had successfully returned to the Death Zone, official SSPI terminology, not more than insurance. Weaving through the remains of buildings and taking hard turns, he believed he'd lost Clay's Eye after a few minutes of hard running and found a place to hide with Sahu in a former office building. 
He had suffered five fractures in his ankles and tibia, multiple torn muscles, and a deep, particularly nasty gash in his left leg from debris after narrowly dodging an attack. Yet Fred's situation was still more dire. He'd been bought an opportunity by the bravery of Eagle, who attempted to stall the S-Class magician in a sneak attack further along Fred's path. Some may ask how he managed to pull this off, given Fred's relatively outrageous speed and his own shortcomings outside of straight lines. According to Eagle, he worked closely with Broken Watch, creating a plan to try to go three on one. Eagle successfully engaged Dry, administering a shock with the taser he kept on himself for emergencies. In the resulting counterattack, Eagle was critically injured, an injury which would leave him bedridden for months. He's still in recovery. It was only a matter of minutes before Class Dry found Fred and saw who's hiding spot. Clapping, he entered the ruins of the office building and said, So, you finally ran out the place to hide. Fred rose, attempting to stand straight despite his pain, and said, I guess, so what are you going to do to me? To Fred's surprise, Cleus was the first to drop the facade, stumbling as he walked forward. Later interviews would confirm that this was due to his muscles still being locked up from Eagle's taser, and not due to physical exhaustion. But in that moment, Fred saw it as an opportunity. The magician said, Well, I'll take my time getting revenge when I finish the Egyptianals. To say the least, she's been a right pain, and it's right time I paid her back. Fred positioned himself in front of her and responded, Hey, I'm still here, and she's not dying yet. Claire's dry stopped and laughed. Oh, come off it, Guppy. What's a lad in your shit gonna do? I can see that gash, and your damn leg's crooked. Face it, you did your best, but it's time to let me. Before Claire's dry could finish his sentence, he was surprised with a knee to the jaw. Fred, in a moment of frustration, launched himself at the villain, suffering a shattered ankle and major fracture to his tibia along with numerous muscle tears, swinging his leg as hard as he could, ripping his connective tissue with the force of it, and connected with a high-speed, extraordinarily strong blow to the magician's face. Fred's knee was shattered, both legs utterly broken, but Cliss Dry was not four feet against the wall behind him from the force. Fred immediately went to shock, barely holding on to consciousness. To his horror, Claes Dry was not unconscious. His jaw was dangling unnaturally from his head, blood poured from his ears, but he still stood and could still walk. He said something, his voice filled with rage and violence, but all Fred could make out were gurgles. The magician pulled out a dagger, making his way to where Fred had collapsed, but as he nearly closed the distance, Claes Dry was once again thrown against the wall. Sahu Sakim had finally awoken. The remaining information comes from her, as Fred lapsed into unconsciousness at this time. Practicing her soul magic, Sahu was able to incapacitate the magician in moments. She, Fred, and Cleus were taken to the hospital without delay. Sahu was the luckiest of those injured, suffering various internal injuries and chemical imbalances since realizing her upper torso was suffered over the fight with Cleus Dry. Due to her abilities, she was able to assist with surgical proceedings on herself, and corrected the attempts the villain made at causing chemical changes in her body. Class Dry suffered catastrophic head wounds, traumatic brain injury similar to chronotraumatic encephalopathy, and a shattered jaw that would require years of corrective surgery to repair. Furthermore, he suffered a radical personality shift following his encounter with Sahu Sakim, due either to the CTE inflicted by Fred, or the residual effects of soul magic according to Sahu. Claes Drawi, actual name Frederick Murphy, remains in behavioral care under the SSPI. Fred Crumbling suffered a shattered patella, tibia, fibia, fever, and hip after his attack on Claes Drawi. Further, he experienced torn ligaments and tendons across his entire right leg, much of his hip, and right torso. In addition, his left leg showed signs of extreme stress, most likely suffered during his flight into the city. Surprisingly, Mr. Crumbling's muscles showed little to no sign of wear and his recovery was unnaturally rapid and complete. In as little as seven months, he was not only to walk unassisted, but was able to run at normal human speeds. As of present, he has made a full recovery and resumed hero work. Eagle, unfortunately, was not found for many hours following this incident, due to him landing in a different section of the city following his engagement with Clay's Dry. In addition to severe internal bleeding, he experienced highly destructive chemical imbalances which caused significant internal organ erosion before being corrected hours later by Sahu Sekhim. He remains in recovery to this day. Normally, being C-rank heroes, Eagle and Fred would have been released from the SSPI and their insurance coverage following a catastrophic interference of this nature. 
Unfortunately, it's not uncommon to see cases like this result in homelessness or permanent assisted living. However, Sahu Sakim insisted on giving both heroes a commendation for their actions, especially noting Fred Crumling's contributions to her survival. When an s rank hero grants a combination, it is considered an acceptance of all responsibility and costs associated with errors caused by the recipient of the combination. Rarely given, it is one of few ways a novice hero can avoid the potentially life-ruining consequences of brave but impulsive behavior. To wit, Fred at the very least would have faced over $10,000 in mandatory fees for disregarding SSPI rules of avoiding engagement with a vastly stronger foe regardless of situation, endangering civilians, endangering co-workers with uncommunicated and improvised strategies, and unauthorized combat as a new hero. Without Sahu Sakim's testimony and commendation, Fred's future would have been a dark one. When asked about the hero who assisted her, Sahu Sakim described him moving like blast lightning. I suppose now is as good a time as any to note that Sahu Sakim, as her namesake would imply, is an Egyptian hero barely seldom to work on American soil. However, the nickname stuck, and Fred chose to move forward as Glass Lightning, a B-rank hero. You just goes to show that you can't judge a book by its cast. Is that good enough? Yeah, yeah, I think it'll do. So remember, there's always room to move up in the world of heroes. More often than not, it's how you use a power, not its innate worth. From all of us at Morden Insurance, thank you for listening, and remember, it's your insurance. Hey there. Uh, thank you for listening. If you're interested in hearing more, uh, we do have other episodes of this uploaded on the channel. And if you're looking for a cause to support, uh, we do have a Patreon up for this project. Uh, should be linked below. Otherwise, though, uh, expect more updates on the Patreon page as we go. And, uh, yeah, thanks for listening.